my name is Sharon Loudon, and I'm an artist and uh, advocate for artists and editor of Living Sustaining Creative Life and the artist as culture producer. And I'm really grateful to be here with three exceptional people that are included in this book. To my left is Harag Vartanian, who is the editor in chief and co founder of Hyperallergic. Yes. His left is Courtney Fink. She is the co-founder of Common Field. And to her left is artist extraordinaire. Can I say that? <laughs> I mean, does that cover everything about you? Or artist extraordinaire Edgar Arsenault? Yeah. say all of them, right? But under the heading of artists. Just like one big. One big hat, right? Like right, right, exactly. So I have my phone here because I sent them all an email yesterday and I'm just gonna refer to it as, as I'm not checking my email. Um, but I wanna thank Sarah so much. First I wanna thank Courtney because she connected me to Sarah. And then Sarah um, is, is hosting this, having us here. This, uh, this particular event is partially funded by the Ford Foundation. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. And then I also have to say there are a few people in the audience that have come very far to be here. Um, there's Robin Hill, who came from uh, the Bay Area, Davis. Jeff Musser has also come from San Francisco, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Wherever that is. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. <laughs> Somewhere up there. Okay, Sacramento. Okay, Sacramento. Well, I've heard of that. Jessica McCambly, Jessica McCambly from San Diego. And then Paul Ha, who is the director of MIT List, flew in here from Boston. And he's right here. together at MIT, and he just showed Edgar's work. Did you guys see each other? No, no. <laughs> okay, so I'm really happy to see all of you. So many wonderful friends who are here. I also want to say that there are two people here who also contributed to my first book. So there's Tim Nolan here. Can you say hi? Say who you are. And then see this cover? The cover boy is here. So I just want to give a, a, a background to this. So in short, I did this first book, Living Sustaining Creative Life, um, which was just really a small project that um, uh, was 40 stories of how artists uh, sustain a life in, in starting a conversation about how they live and sustain a creative life. And that went on a 62 stop book tour, is now sold in 18 countries, and it's in its seventh printing as of last Monday. Wow. Um, which is amazing, and I saw that that need was there. Oh, okay. I saw that that need was there, and so did my publisher. So he asked me in the middle of that tour, "Do you want to do another book?" And I said, "Absolutely." And so the second book is a book that uh, has artists that not only have a leg in the art world, where they show their work. Um, in white boxes, but then they also have a bridge into the public realm. And then the, uh, the four words written by Harav Vartanian, and then there are three concluding statements that are very powerful by three powerful women, including Courtney Fink. Um, in fact, tonight's the first time we've ever met in person after working together on, on this project, on the phone and email, so it's very, very exciting. Um, these projects are shared projects, so the royalties from each of these books are split. The first book split 44 ways, the second book 45 ways, and then every, that's very funny. And then everybody um, uh, gets their own copyright. I am also a contributor to the book, so I'm just like everybody else. Um, we made Living and Sustaining Creative Life a fiscally sponsored entity, so we raised um, money, including a grant, generous grant for the Ford Foundation. We've raise close to $200,000 to get artists all over the world. I believe that artists should be paid for when they come um, on, uh, talk to anybody, um, share their knowledge, including all of us today. Um, and I think that by doing this, I'm hoping to set a standard 
that wage, wageforwork.com, has helped me set. Um, in addition to that, uh, we are making this, uh, uh, this project, I'm calling it, because really the book is just a platform for conversation into a case study. So every event is being recorded, and I know um, my husband's gonna hate me for this, so he's right there recording this, and it will be published after the tour is finished. I think this is the 25th event of, mm -hmm. of the tour, out of 95. Wow. So we're going for two years, um, 95. Yeah, um, I'm looking at him because there's another number that it really is, but I think it'll just be 95. Um, so, and, and also we are doing this, uh, having each of these events on social media, so if you wish to live tweet this or photographs or however you want to participate in social media, just use the hashtag lives. We launched this book at the Strand and it was, it was 250 people and three artists from this book, Morshin Alhari, um, Shanique Smith, and Steve Lambert read from their essays. It was very powerful. I'd like to do that tonight a little bit to start. Um, so I'm, if you don't mind, I want to start from the book and read parts of the essay of these essays and then ask each of these contributors to talk about them and to get into some issues of who a contemporary artist is today and then also to talk about something that's been talked about at every event, which is how do artists function in this political climate. It's come up every single time and I'd like to talk about how artists are um, yeah, not only functioning, but to some of the artists who say to me that they don't feel comfortable working, they don't feel value, um, to be able to answer that, because every artist has value, and I think it's political no matter what you're making, just the fact that you're making it is political. So I want to start with um, just reading part of Harag's essay, um, The Ford, and if anybody has your books in front of you, maybe you can follow with me. Would that be fun? <laughs> so let's do um, <laughs> page uh, 14. Everybody together. Don't you want a book now? <laughs> no, they're for sale. <laughs> I should have said that um, Especially since we make like $10 a year on this book. Um, it's true, our first check was $10.04 a person in the first book. <laughs> Uh, I hope we will make more now that, oh, the second book already after a month went to a second printing. So and we, that's over 4,000 books in one, book, in one month, which is amazing. Um, so there must be a need. So I'm going to start with page 14, the second paragraph. Parag says, you tell me you're yes, I did. I sent you an email last night. <laughs> <laughs> I, I read it, Parag. an email. <laughs> Can I do that? <laughs> You don't want to do it, do you? No. Are you sure? Do you want to do it? Okay. What? She said. Okay, right. Oh, you want to do it? So can you do these two paragraphs? Okay. Here's a microphone. Oh, oh that's so great. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. So these two paragraphs. Is that okay? Or do you want to do something else? cultural producers, but the evolving nature of artistic practice means we have to adapt our language to reflect a new reality. Artists can't be beholden to old stereotypes of inspired acts of creation or even galleries and museums to determine the, their path. They work in culture, but they're also plugged into larger networks of power, finance, identity, and information systems. They create the objects, generate the ideas, and produce the models that allow others to dream, feel, and ponder. Sometimes they reflect our world back at us, and the best of them do it with uncanny, uncanny precision. Others imagine what we thought impossible and wait while everyone else catches up. In my dream world, artists would be part of every aspect of our lives. They would help make hospitals more receptive and healing places. They would create street furniture that encourages contemplation and community, and they'd help local governments communicate more effectively with the public. I hope this book will help uh, shattered the old stereotypes of artists as exotic and enigmatic creatures, and in their place, construct a new image using stories of individuals who sustain remarkable artistic lives while nurturing themselves with families, activism, volunteerism, small businesses, hobbies, and politics. I think artists do that now, right? So can you elaborate a little bit how you see artists 
do those things right now? I mean, how, how are artists integrated in society and how are we contributors to, to the public right now? So I just want to first of all say when, when she asked me to write the foreword, she wouldn't let me see any of the essays. So, you know, this is kind of like, it was one of those things where you had to sort of think, okay, what is the bigger, like after the conversations we had, so a lot of this came out of that. And so I also sort of tap my own experience talking to a lot of art schools and just like hearing the fact that people still have these very like traditional ideas and I don't think we have to regurgitate them, but you know, you know. And, uh, and so it was, it, for me it was the permission we have to keep giving people, it feels like, you know, to understand that like anything is possible, like meaning like they can insert themselves in all these conversations. You know, you don't have to wait and sort of join a conversation that's going on already. And you know, and I think that was part of the fantasy I had, like writing this was like, what if everybody who came out of art school or even who didn't come out of art school just said, okay, well the world is my oyster, where do I fit in and where can I make work that is going to augment or change or influence and, and you know, and I, I you know, I would love for that to be the case, like a normal case where people are like, okay, I want to join, you know, the immigration department at, you know, uh, in DC and learn about, like, I don't know, and like help integrate and come up with an idea to help, you know, new immigrants in this country in different ways or something, you know, and, I, and that's kind of like a fantasy I have, like how great would that be if artists felt empowered to approach organizations and departments and governments or whatever and say, hey, I want to do this, and then create opportunities that then, therefore, like allow other artists to follow, or also like open some doors, you know. And I, I think that's where that came from, and that was kind of a hope. And and I was happy after you know reading the book, like sort of understanding the fact that everyone had all these like what probably sounded like crazy ideas at the time that sort of worked, you know. And I and I just and I was hoping my forward would sort of give people that permission. Yeah, I'm glad you have faith in me. Because <laughs> I made sure of that, of course. So, yeah, I didn't have any of the, the artists or the contributors read the essays. Because in the first book, I made the mistake of telling some uh, contributors who, who was in the book, you know what they did? They called them and said, oh, what are you writing about? I was like, no, that's not going to work. So I made sure that nobody could read it at all. So, right, Courtney? Right. <laughs> so, Courtney, I want you to read your section is, is on um, 393, page 393. And you talk about smaller scale, that's that second paragraph, which is really powerful. And then you go into uh, on to 394. Okay. Um, smaller scale does not mean smaller impact. Operating from a nimble position allows for the creation of new models and highly participatory strategies that would not otherwise be possible. Working at a smaller scale allows for more direct connection to people and communities. This is where real dialogue and contact happens, where new forms of culture are developed and where people truly can come together. This kind of work builds bridges between artists and communities. Often, the public doesn't know how to reach artists. Likewise, artists don't readily know how to find or communicate well with the public position to bridge those gaps. In turn, connecting the public to artists in an intimate and direct way builds culture. The value of such engaged arts practices, while well, well understood by those within the field, is not widely appreciated more broadly because these practices often exist in opposition to commercial and capital culture. Additionally, the impact of those artists' works is very difficult to measure and can take many years to realize. Engaged artists and small organizations build social, artistic, and financial value, but it's often many years after a project has been realized. If you follow the tra uh, trajectory of a project, the full value of its impact is often attributed far from where, it galvanized, where, where the galvanizing work began. Sometimes those impacts are linked to larger institutions and commercial entities, which are increasingly eager to absorb ideas whose genesis is in the work of artists and small organizations. But the ground level is where things start. I love that. So the reason why I love it so much is because when I read your essay, I felt as, as an artist, obviously, um, I felt that it gave me confidence that these organizations when sometimes artists doubt that they're really there for them, 
because sometimes the gate, they're, they're like gatekeepers, they feel like they're not open doors. But you're saying no way, that they, we are there for, you're there for artists. So can you talk about that and then the work that you do for Common Field and how that is towards opening doors for artists, especially in experimentation, which I think if the NEA grant money goes away, that's gonna be much harder, don't you think, in rural communities? Absolutely, yeah. Um, at the time I wrote this essay, which was last year, and like Rug, I was feeling a little, you know, how do you write a conclusion for a book you haven't read? Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was challenging for you. And I definitely kept calling Sharon. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> I just wanted to like really, you know, my angle is, you know, I went to art school, but I really took a turn as uh, using my uh, creativity as, um, as an organizer, really, from the very beginning. And uh, my focus has always been running arts organizations like LACE. And LACE is such a, an important model for the field and the history of artists from spaces. And I ran um, Southern Exposure in San Francisco for about 14 years. And at the time I wrote this essay, I had just left that job and was trying to start Common Field. And Common Field, for those of you that don't know what it is, it's a new national network of independent arts organizations and organizers that connects supports and advocates for artist-centered culture. So it's trying to build a national um, network of places like LACE, Southern Exposure, and small artist-run spaces around the country. Um, and so my job now is to kind of take a step back and really think about the role of the small scale and how important that is in the kind of engaged um, culture that artists can make. And so my, my rationale was to try to make that case, to try to really talk about the small scale and how imperative and important it is and what risk capital exists in spaces like that to invest at the ground floor of that kind of thinking. And so that's really what I was, was getting at. And I, I really, um, to answer your question, I do believe that um, it's without some infrastructure often a lot of these um, practices can't exist, but oftentimes it takes a more open-minded, um, nimble, small-scale organization to invest in a really radical new idea. And I really believe if you look at the larger ecosystem of how artists get supported, it's really often at those small organizations that the genesis happens and those things get their start, and how important those can be. And in my essay, I talk a lot about how oftentimes those ideas get adopted and appropriated by larger institutions, um, which is very common, I'd say, in my experience. But really, when I talk to so many artists I've worked with, they all look back to the smaller organizations that gave them their first chance, uh, invested in them when no one else would, um, presented an idea that seemed totally wild and too risky for another large organization to take on. And so I'm interested in bridging the gap between what it means to do this type of practice and who is there to support that. Um, my job is to create systems of supports for artists. And right now I'm focused on a more meta level of that, which is how do you support organizers who support artists. Um, and so that's really, that was How do you do that? I am trying to figure that out, but I actually <laughs> think um, connecting the, the voices together is so much more powerful. So good. We're all sort of out there on our own uh, trying to figure it out, but really it's an extremely vast field. It's a, it's a really huge, I'd say the hugest part of the arts ecosystem, and collectively speaking, if the field can connect together and start to unify around some big organizing principles, I believe we can get a lot done, and there's a huge amount of um, uh, momentum in this project. In the first year and a half, we've already had almost 600 groups join join um, this growing network, and we have annual gatherings, which the next one is going to be here in LA from November, November 2nd to 5th. And so I believe this group as a whole is actually going to be a growing part of how artists get support when increasingly larger institutions are completely risk averse and aren't maybe ready to support the kind of practice that um, Parag was talking about where artists are changing the world, where artists are working in a more integrated way in uh, peripheral fields and non-arts practices. Um, I think that how do you integrate arts more into culture? You have to start somewhere and often I truly believe it does start at, at the ground level. Love that. You need to frame that. It's great. Um, so, Edgar, going right perfect segue to talk about something you started, Watts House Project, right? And so if you can read 
the paragraph starting at, as an art project. Did you get my email? Because <laughs> we just that. saw each other last night. So. Yeah, yeah, I got the email, Sharon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, I sent it to you too. So, did you get where we're starting and stopping? Because we can't read your whole essay. Because his essay is the longest essay in the book. 348 words. It's clear that Edgar and I are behind us. <laughs> Slide. So I think that you cannot blame the alcohol this time. Um, so if you can read... Oh, my God. Dude, I can just tell you. Oh, my God. Oh, I see it. I see it. Oh, my God. Okay. I should have called you. you should. I, I, I read it. I, I, I see it. Okay, so, wait. so it's that too. To when you say it's to the next, when you say to everything's changed. If you go past that, I'll stop you. Okay. Oh. Okay. Ready? Oh yeah, your essay is great, by the way. It's awesome. Yeah, it's uh, beautiful, and it's uh, four, it's four pages. Uh, unlike mine. <laughs> <laughs> I even stopped reading my own essay after. I took a break. I just My publisher, I said to them, because I only had 150,000 only, 150,000 for this book. And I went to them and I actually said, Can I include it? They were like, No. So we had to get it down to 7,348 words, right? That's good. That's right. good. Yeah, you know, everybody needs a good editor, I'll just say that. What did you say? She's the last two words. Yeah. 48. <laughs> it just ended up being that. Okay, so only two paragraphs, and then okay. we can elaborate on that. Okay, ready? I normally don't like reading. No way! I'm going to read, okay. So, as okay. an art project, Watts House Project was nimble. When we had an idea, the family and artists involved would design it and build it together, uh, completing each effort in a week's time. So, Watts House Project is an artist-driven neighborhood redevelopment project down in Watts. We were based on 107th Street, right across the street from the Watts Towers. And I wanted to take it over the project in 1999. And I was there until 2012. Um, so this is just so, just so you know what WHP stands for. We didn't concern ourselves with insurance or liability. We were just focusing on the work and having fun doing it. Getting support from the Hammer Museum made us competitive for even greater funding. The contradiction being, of course, when I really needed the money, no one wanted to give it to me. But when others were giving me money, I got even more support from those that rejected me the first time. But the larger foundations would only support us if we became a nonprofit organization ourselves. That, and basically, what that sentence is saying is that organizations will reward you essentially for not dying. So they're going to leave you out there to starve. But if you somehow make it, they're like, we will reward you if everybody else is dead. Um, WSP now had a small, committed team of artists, administrators, and curators on board, so as a group, we greatly debated this next step. How could you still be a fluid art project and an organization at the same time? The environmental movement had become a green economy, and social networks had transformed socialism from ideology into communication platforms. Emerging in the shadows of despair coming from the crashing housing market were now incubator models popping up in every field around us. Obama had just been elected and hope and change made anything seem possible. Do you guys remember that? Amongst all the optimism, none of us realized just how faithful a decision it would be to become a formalized organization in a neighborhood ruled by informal economies. The nonprofit model was a child of the industrial age, an out-of-date tool not well suited for the post-industrial information age. Yet the ethos of the nonprofit is still beautiful. No one person can own it. It exists to bring value to the social body. With few choices available to us, I co founded WHP as an organization with Sue Bell Yang in 2009. Could we still be a fluid art project and an organization at the same time? When the IRS got involved, everything changed. That's like cliffhanger. No. Right there. That's why I didn't go on. No, but maybe you can talk. So in Omaha, we were at the 
Bemis uh, Center together. And it was really a very strong conversation and the things you said there are so memorable to me. I would love for you to talk about, especially after Courtney, just talk about the optimism, right, of these or small organizations. But actually sometimes the reality can shift in, in the reality of actually following through and, and directing and uh, being carried through, in this case, the Wass House Project. So can you talk about the strength of what happened during that time, the optimism, but also what happened in the failures? Right. And, and how that's positive, because you, you really have spoken about that, and in the essay you did too. Well, I'll just make like a little tiny digression. So Sarah is kind of my, my academic godmother, so she actually <laughs> got me into Art Center when I had no idea what even contemporary art was. So she was my guidance counselor and when I was a young, trying to figure it out undergrad, she somehow nurtured me through the entire process. But coincidentally, Lace is the place where I had like my first real art exhibition wow. in Los Angeles. They used to Just have like an event morning. called the Lace Annuale. Does anybody remember this? It was like an emerging artist show. And three drawings from that exhibition was actually purchased by the San Diego Museum of Contemporary Art. Wow. And that changed everything for me. So, you know, kudos to Sarah and to Lace. Well, I wasn't here back then. No, you were not. <laughs> <laughs> Point, the, the small organizations do play a really big role um, and continue to. I'm actually trying to find out if they'll be a sponsor for some new project I'm working on. But anyway, um, so when when we were at Art Project, the Watts House Project, um, things were relatively simple. There was me, it usually was another artist, and then it was a family. We'd have an idea, we would design it together, we would build it together, and then we'd have some carne asada at the end and some cerveza. It was always nice, you know, we sort of have like a dinner. But the idea was to be, to have an idea and then to realize it as quickly as possible. Um, but one of the beautiful things of working in a neighborhood, especially one that's as sort of tight-knit as, as, as 107th Street, that, you know, one neighborhood would say like, hey, you know, thanks, the, the work you did for us was great, but what about my neighbor? Like, <coughs> So like very slowly, it started to organically grow from one family to the next. So in the beginning, you know, there was, you know, three of us. And then when I left the organization in 2012, there was about 85 people involved. Which is great, because, you know, we, as a, you know, our operating budget in the beginning was $6,000. And then when I left, we had raised three quarters of a million dollars in three years. And those are like, you know, that's a lot of money for us. Um, but when we had gotten our grant from the Hammer, which was, I think, $30,000 at the time, um, other organizations had started learning about what we're doing, and they say, hey, we want to support you, but we can't do that unless you become your own nonprofit. And we struggled with the idea, like I said in the essay, can you still be fluid and be formal at the same yeah. time? And when the IRS got involved, the thing that we didn't realize is that the families when we're helping to steer the entire project, had slowly transitioned from being collaborators and become clients. It was the board, which is made up of a lot of really well-intentioned people, um, but the families were never able to fully interface, interface with the board structure. And it created a, a schism um, within the work that which we were doing and literally altered our mission and our projects. And it, amongst a number of other factors, <laughs> the point we actually stopped doing the things that the organization was there to help us do. That the, the shift in mentality became that the organization wasn't a vehicle to do the work, the organization was the reason why we were doing the work. And I fundamentally felt that that was, was wrong. Oh, um, <coughs> One of the things that was, that was really difficult for me is that, you know, I've been involved with this thing for 15 years and I had all these really amazing relationships with these families. And when when I left, which, is this longer than an answer that, that you want to give? I just want you to cut me off. I will. You know, you, you I will. Cut me off. Okay, so I will. give me another just, minute. I'm, yeah, I'm trying will. to be yeah. cognizant. I'm actually looking at Paul's face and he's, even my friend is nodding off. So I know that. <laughs> I know that I'm getting long winded at that point. Well, but 
you know, one of the things that I did with, with Watts House Project is that I never took a salary. Um, so we made sure that everybody else got paid, but I never took one. So I, I, I offset that by selling art and through my gallery. But when we went from three people to 85 people, I started spending less time in the studio and more time managing the organization. And I was making less work, which means I was showing less, I was selling less. And so, it, you know, I slowly was slipping into the hole. And my personal life was also being stretched. So, like, personally, professionally, psychologically, it sort of completely atomized me in a way that took me really about three years to recover both emotionally, mm -hmm. physically, and, and mm -hmm. economically. Um, and why did I bring that up? But just well, in time question. to write the essay. Oh, and just in, well, yeah, actually, the essay. This is the, the first, first time, time that, that you've spoken about it. So, yeah, I didn't really speak about it. So I'm going to ask a question then. So do, do you think then, so the reason why I, I see, see this thread between all of these essays, and I think that in this day and age, <clears throat> excuse me, there, there are a lot of artists who just make painting and drawings, and you, and sculpture, let's say objects, and you make drawings too, and you do installations of uh, all different things. But your work is shown in a gallery, and that's part of part of the work that you do. But how would you say in this time, and and, and I think every artist in this book talks about this, is that how can an artist get outside of that white box when they can't necessarily rely upon that gallery to fully sustain them? Because I know very few artists can sustain a creative life just from gallery sales. Can you sustain a creative life just from gallery sales? Um, uh, sometimes. Sometimes. I mean, there's, sometimes. Sometimes. I mean, there's, a, there's the peaks and valleys of, of right, exactly. having selling art to make a living, which is great because I thought that that's what I wanted to do and I committed myself. I quit my job and said I'm going to commit myself to doing it. And that was about 12 years. But you know, one of the schisms that happens when you make art for a living and you're trying to pay your bills is that there's always a thing is like, am I doing making this decision because I think that that's what the work wants? Or am I making this decision because I think that will make, somehow make people make them be more responsive than the marketplace? And that's only amplified because, you know, there's like 1,500 art fairs and you're expected to participate in a lot of them, you know? So, so that starts to happen. But I, I, I would say, like, as far as understanding the gallery, how many people here show in galleries and want to show in galleries? <clears throat> Oh, yeah, that's, so like, that's you know, interesting. Um, that's interesting, right? But, but I want to just, I want to go to Courtney too and talk about this, but the thing is is that I'm interested in that balance. So I think right now that artists have to get out of those white boxes because not every gallery can even uh, take care of, first of all, they don't take care of artists. Artists take care of themselves. Second of all, that not enough, not, there's not enough artists for every, not enough galleries for every artist out in the world. And then third, that right now it seems like there's an opportunity for artists to do other things outside on their own to create their own opportunities. And I know at Common Field there are artist-run spaces, right, that you work with. And so how do you, can you describe some of the people that are in Common Field that do that? They juggle how running their artist-run spaces and then sustaining their creative lives. Can, can I say just one thing about galleries? Yeah. Of my nonprofit spaces. So, you know, galleries really are like a system of Robin Peter, PayPal. Like, I mean, even the biggest blue chip galleries are constantly trying to figure out how to keep their doors open. Um, so, I mean, they're not like cash flushed um, places in right. most instances because most museums are asking the galleries essentially to pay for their sh to pay for their artists to have shows in their institutions. Now, MIT didn't do that, you know. Paul was charming enough, they just gave him the money. He just walked in and they said, <laughs> Actually, that's not true. I mean, he's charming, but they didn't, they didn't, that wasn't the situation. Um, but it's just, it's important to understand that galleries play a very important function. Of course they do. Not, of of course, it's just one part of the ecosystem. Of right. those four white walls. You can't separate yourself from the entire thing. Correct. Well, some people can. But. Right. So, what do you, thank you. But what do you think, Courtney, about the people in Common Field who do that as examples of artists who actually have their, like, maybe a leg in the art world and then they do these other things to sustain a creative, creative lives? Yeah, and um, I really relate to, to Edgar's story and, you know, 
the nonprofit forum is deeply flawed, and I think the next evolution of it is people really using it as a means to an end, but trying to experiment with it as a form as well. And I know that at Common Field, that's that's what we're interested in. And um, you know, um, as someone who's worked in nonprofits for 25 years, you know, Common Field's actually not a nonprofit yet. We have intentionally steered away from that, partly because we were worried about exactly what Edgar is talking about, and everyone who started it um, together thought there's something that's not working anymore with this form, and the field at large is not adopting it anymore. And I'd say 80% of our members are not nonprofits. Wow. Um, because they don't believe, um, jokingly, when we have like our gatherings, people are so um, actually like adamantly against it. They call it the nonprofit industrial complex. <laughs> um, it's true. It's true. And um, you know we have been very hesitant to become a nonprofit because we are trying to model practices for the field, but we finally decided to become one. But we're doing so, I think, in a very creative way, and being very transparent and making our rationale to our entire um, community as we go to try to explain why we, in order to support the field, do need to be a nonprofit. Um, but I would say the artists run, like even for me, starting Common Field. It's not, it wasn't a paid job. I, like Edgar, had to have three other jobs. Um, just like, and you know, I sort of thought, oh, I'm an artist now. I have three other jobs to do my creative project. And uh, Common Field is like my hobby, and the other jobs were my day job. And so I think it's a very similar situation. Actually, uh, being in LA, I've started to really understand the ecosystem here. And the majority of nonprofits in LA, most of the people running them aren't even paid. Honestly, wow. The reality is, this is not a healthy field, and um, in order to really take risks and support artists, sort of in that nimble way, oftentimes there isn't the kind of support that needs to exist. Which is why I'm interested in changing that or trying to change that. But um, the artists run. Many, many artists, I'd say, are interested in helping other artists, right? And that's what kind of field is. For Edgar to start another, as an artist, to start supporting other people and artists, I think it's a really common practice. And I'd say organizational, running an organization oftentimes is an extension of an artist's practice. And artists are curators, artists are writers, Correct. artists are organize, organizers, and they have an, an amazing breadth of skills. We have to kind of know how to do everything. And so I'd say it's not really that far off from running um, an organization. And when I say organization, I mean it in a very loose sense of the word. Publications, residencies, public projects, um, anything that exists to support other artists, really, or even sometimes not really. There's a lot of like uh, collectives in the group that they're just kind of creating a framework to support. You want to comment on the nonprofits? Yeah, I, the, I mean, I, I think this is something that's only been happening over the last five years, I feel like, at least that I've been hearing, people being more critical of the nonprofit model. I mean, clearly it works for some things, but it doesn't work for a lot of things. And you know, in one, uh, I'm sure many of you probably know the book, The Revolution Will Not Be Funded. Great book in terms of, in terms of there's a whole essay about the nonprofit industrial complex. How like nonprofits were partly created when the government stopped funding certain things and private money started entering the field to yeah. supplement governmental programs that didn't exist anymore or whatever. Um, and, uh, and I think it's really important, like when we were starting Hyperallergic, one of the things where we were like, we had to have that question, right? Do we become a nonprofit? Do we become a for-profit? And we decided to go for-profit, one, because we really suck at raising money. Um, and I had worked in nonprofits for 15 years at that point, and I actually saw the limitations, you know, in terms of be, writing the kind of confrontational writing we sometimes publish, like nonprofits, it's not always going to work, you know, and it's like people are going to make the phone calls. And, and, I, and I worked at a publication, or at least I wrote for it, um, which did not pay me, that was a nonprofit. And, you know, and it was amazing. I remember once writing something, and the publisher actually pointed out to me, it was like, well, I hope that person who gives us money doesn't read that because they're a fan of Michael Bloomberg. And I said, so, you know, and I was just like, and I was like, I mean, I didn't get, there were no repercussions for what I wrote, but it was like the fact that they would even say that to me. I was like, who cares, Mayor Bloomberg? Like, I was like, really? This is what you're worried about? But I mean, these are the conversations that people actually have. So it's like, it's not going to solve everything. 
you know, and I, and I have to say, I really dislike the idea that everyone just feels like nonprofits are just uh, kumbaya, you know, it's like, and I think it's an outside, people, those of us who have worked in them know it's a little different, but I feel like on the outside, there's this perception that I think people are starting to realize it's like, sometimes they are, but a lot of times they're just vehicles for people to, to enact their agendas, you know, and, and, and I think that happens. It, 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 there's something else to be said about it. Um, which, you know, I, I, when it comes to situations like my organization no longer performing in the way in which it performed, um, there was, uh, you know, quite a degree of finger pointing in the beginning of why things went wrong in the way in which they did. And at a certain point when you sort of analyze personal intention, you, have to, you realize that it only gets you so far. Right? Because the tendency of the 501c3 operates independently of the intentions of the user. Right? It does cert it performs true. certain kinds of actions independent of what you want to do with it. So for example, um, you know, the 501c3 is inherently hierarchical. Right? So if it doesn't match up with your temperament and values, if you're not a person who's very top down then it will make you into one. <laughs> because that's how it is structured, how information, how, how control is function. And it, and, it, and it starts with the IRS. <laughs> oh, God. Right? No, 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 no. I mean, right. and, and, it, and it's worth recognizing that these things were designed to make us, to, to allow us to do things better. So, like nobody owns it, but it benefits us all. That's great. Because you know, capitalism is not the great white horse that, <laughs> you know, that, that, that Republicans make it out to be. And it's not, it never ever trickles down. And I don't think that that's its thing. But I, I did also recognize that within the 501c3, that the tendency of the system also is to push you outside of the creative space and turn you into a fundraiser and a manager. And that realization as well was like, well, how did that happen? Like, when did that start happening? And it was a slow evolution. You know? But can you talk about too, like, thanks, can you talk about too, let's, I just want to touch upon this, but you've talked to me about the fact that if the NEA goes away, that might be good. Well, I don't think it would be like fully good, but I think it's, it, becomes, <laughs> it becomes like, you know, it, it will, like I feel like there's certain sort of residual things that we're sort of like realizing that aren't fully working, but nobody wants to tackle sometimes. And I feel like one of the things is government funding, like having an actual sustained campaign where we're actually lobbying and pushing for real funding in real numbers. You know, and I, and, and you know, I have to say, it's like, it, it, is the NEA doing what it should be doing? It's kind of, you know, a little bit maybe, but like it's not doing enough of it, you know, and I'm certainly not at the scale we need in this country, you know, so, so is, it, is it a little bit of a band-aid for a much bigger problem? And I think it kind of is sometimes, you know, and, and I, that's, so I would like, I would like us to like look at the NEA as just like one little piece mm -hmm. of a much bigger mm -hmm. agenda that we need to push. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and the problem is we haven't created that agenda yet fully. You know, we, have, we don't even agree on it, you know, um, or at least we're starting to have those conversations. But I think also artists don't, and Cornier would love for you to comment on this too, I don't think artists know necessarily uh, what steps to take to be able to create funding themselves. I mean, that is a huge thing. It's like taking that baby step. I mean, I agree with you. If you have, uh, if you have an opportunity, you should share it. The backbone of these books is about generosity. The people I select criteria for this book, they have to be generous. And I said today in Northridge, I said, some people I'm very honored that people would come to me and they say, I'd like for you to consider me as part of your books. And I say to them, okay, do you give to artists? 
and they, if they pause for more than three seconds, I don't want to talk to you. So I don't even talk to them. I mean, quite frankly, I don't, because I don't really want to be around someone who holds things too tight to themselves. So it was great to hear what you were talking about, how most of these people actually give to artists, but how do they realistically fund what they're doing? Do you have comments about that? Of course. <laughs> She would, you know. Exactly. I mean, there has to be another answer. I don't believe that there should be any dependence, actually, quite frankly. And I do believe that the gallery world is just one part of the ecosystem. But I think the loss of the NEA maybe means something is greater is opening up, or maybe that sounds very optimistic. I mean, if you think about the history of the NEA, they abandoned artists a long time ago. Yeah, really. So. They stopped supporting individual artists, and I think what that means for our culture is hugely symbolic. And that is devaluing the role of artists in our country. Exactly. And so um, I'm, a, I'm a big believer that the NEA should remain. I agree that it's not fulfilling its role, but it actually is of vital importance in non-urban centers. In fact, sometimes it's the only source of funding in rural spaces and in you know places that really have no other access to um, funding, but I actually think um, so much of the burden on getting money these days is from private sources, and it's like privatizing um, the art world. Like, how do you get money to do what you do? How do you support your work? And I think um, individual artists just like, do they want to just be fundraising all the time? Uh, probably not, actually. And it's a really, you know, I know a lot of artists that hate it, that refuse to do it. Um, so I actually think it's about value. It's a value system. I agree. There's a lack of value, I think, in, in this country for the role of artists. There's a lack of value for the role of art in our country, and I think the way that our government has set up supporting it really reinforces that. This is all the more reason it needs to remain because it's symbolic. Yeah, $150 million isn't going to get you very far when you think about that money goes to every art form in all 50 states. That's pathetic. It's not nearly enough money. On the other hand, the fact that our country is investing in culture is at least something. It's better than nothing. Once you pull the plug, that's gone. And I think I'm not very excited about entirely having a privately funded art world. Already yeah, to have to rely on individual donors is a really complicated exchange. Um, and I do believe that the public value is really worthwhile. I totally agree. So, Edgar, perfect segue. So, when you uh, asked for money as an artist for this project, what was that like? What's the reality of that? <laughs> <laughs> and then, no, I, mean, we, I really believe that actually artists helping other artists does yield a lot of opportunities, but also funding. And so, uh, and, and also, I, I also believe, I want to get into this too in a second, is there, everybody wears multiple hats, as you were mentioning, like you work all of these jobs, I mean, Harag does so many different things, and you do as well. We don't, we're not just like critic, curator, artist, right? So you, I, I, I know that you collaborate with a lot of different people in order to get that funding too, right? You, you, you talk to way different people, right? Can you talk about that? Yes. Um... Well, I, I grew up in like a, you know, my parents didn't go to college, so we, you know, I grew up in kind of a hand-to-mouth kind of household, no savings accounts or anything like that, so, the, you know, so I was raised with a kind of ethos that if you ask somebody for something, you're expected to reciprocate it back in equal value. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a paradigm shift that you have to go through if you're doing something bigger than yourself, because at a certain scale, like if you're asking somebody to support you on the level of 20, 30, 40, 50, 150, 300 thousand dollars, whatever it may be, if for, an, uh, for a small organization or project, you really can't reciprocate that value back to that person. For example, like I can't afford to buy my own artwork, right? Like that's a strange thing. Hey, I want to buy it in store. I just like it. I know, I've never heard that either. That's a really good point. But it is, it is Can't you make it affordable for yourself? <laughs>
Um, there's maybe some possibility <laughs> for tax purposes. Um, but you know, one of the things that I had to do, sort of paradigm-wise, is that I had to, to change the way in which I thought what I was doing when I would go to someone to ask for support. For one, I had to understand support along a spectrum that not just that is not just money. So it's intelligence. You know, you want their will. Sometimes you do want their dollars, but also you want access to their networks. You want them to refer you to someone. Um, and and, and, and all of that strategy, you're, you're always, at least for me, I realize that it's, you have a core constituency, you have a core audience, and you just slowly are trying to expand on that from that kind of orderly and peripheral interest. You kind of want to bring them into the center. And one of the ways in which I, I, I realize that you do that is by when you go to someone and you ask for support, Really what you're saying is that I believe that you and your life will be enriched by being a part of this. And by you saying that, you really have to believe it. And people will, people will, people feel that if you, if you give it to them in a way. Um, but also like on the level of being on the ground and in the neighborhood, it's important that when you are able to bring resources to people, that you put them in a situation in which they can reciprocate. Right, so, because if you don't give people the opportunity to reciprocate what you bring, then you basically are perpetuate, perpetually keeping them in a space of charity. And you're not creating charity because I'm not a philanthropist. Like, I'm an artist who's trying to create a space of mutual benefit. You're smiling. I'm just smiling. Oh. <laughs> anyway, I want to open up to questions, but I also want you to comment, Harak, about how you see a lot of artists and that community community is core, I think, in order to move things forward. Can you comment on that a little bit? So general for me to say that where you see that's very effective and then also for individual artists, how you think that that is effective? Oof, that's okay. a lot. That's a lot. That's I know. A lot. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. But I know you can answer it. <laughs> um, the, the most effective I've seen uh, artists working together are usually when there's um, when the, strangely I feel like it's it's usually like artists that take on social activism but kind of in a creative way I feel like tends to be some of the most creative things I see um, I was using this example earlier with someone that it's like even something like Occupy do you know what I mean? Like, a lot of people don't realize some of the earliest people in Occupy were performance artists. You know, and I, if you think about it, it makes sense. People, like, performance artists understand that claiming space in public creates ripple effects. Do you know what I mean? You can't always control what they are, but you understand that claiming space and doing an action has repercussions <laughs> on other people. And if you think of it, that's kind of what Occupy was. You know, and it was a few months before a number of artists, uh, performance artists did performances in Wall Street area. And there were a lot of things, a lot of it came out of 16 Beaver. We have, you know, we have the piece at the front by Irene and Renee and stuff. I mean, these are people who are, were doing this consciously. They understood that a political agenda sometimes comes from doing things that we learn through artistic practice and engaging the world with them. And I think that was the example of like where that really did have an impact. You know, 16 Beaver was kind of like the brain, like the place where some of these ideas were worked out through the years in this anti-capitalist process, you know, and right on Wall Street, you know what I mean? So that's an example of like where artists can take their, take their ideas and then experiment. And I mean, no one thought Occupy would be what it is. I mean, sure, there are failures, of course, you know, but, you know, um, but there were also some successes in mm -hmm. that. And also just have, have switching people's mind and thinking, oh wait, capitalism is not the only thing. So, mm -hmm. You know, it's like, and that was the way artists were able to use that. There's, there's something to be said about value there, at least its relationship to support. Because one of the things that I, that I that I learned is that investment incentivizes investment. So if you're in there and you're doing actions and people see you doing it, they're mm -hmm. like. Oh hey, I want to be part of that too. Yeah. Or hey, I know somebody so dependent upon the porousness of your structure. Like you can get activists in there, you can get musicians in there, you can get grandma down the street who you know got robbed by Lincoln, saved from the loans years ago, and it's like now this is my platform. You know what I mean? So at least as far as sort of thinking about that occupying space, but it also is a way of just thinking about that can actually become support as well. Right? No, absolutely. 
But in the case of Occupy, it was really important because of like the idea of territory. Do you know what I mean? In this kind of like gentrification, colonial, settler colonialism space, to say like, we're gonna occupy land, and we are going to make, we're gonna make this count. And people are gonna be like, wait, somebody occupied a park in Lower Manhattan? Like that's possible and no one's getting killed? You know, like it was just like, but that kind of split the switch for some people. You know, and I mean, it's not the only thing. I'm just using an example I know where artists were involved to a certain degree. And it's like, but no one really thinks about artists' involvement in something like that quite that way. But it was a real thing. And I just remember it because within the first week, I was down in Sakati Park with, uh, with my husband, Vikan, who's here. And, you know, I was like, wait a minute. I recognize that person. That's a performance artist. There's another performance. And I was like, what's going on? You know, what? why are they here? You know what I mean? Like, and it's good that performance artists were the vanguard because they're, they're keen on making a fool of themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Of wine. <laughs> we all have anyway, I just want to say, too, though, don't you think, though, that the ways in which this works in raising money or having these collaborations is because artists are leaders, we can be leaders, but also everybody has, because we have multiple hats, we don't lose our power to having collaborations with museum curators, with with gallery people, with other people in the art world. I feel like there's no divisions. I mean, with Paul being in the audience, right? He's just like all the artists here. And did you know that Paul went to school for art and he's a musician? I don't know if anybody knew that. <laughs> so, yeah, it would be great if he was performing. But anyway, the point is, is that I think we're all on the same page and if we can treat people that way with respect and have these exchanges where you were very successful at doing so really for that time. Do you find too that that's part of the equation, Courtney, and these people being able to thrive? Um, I'm not sure actually, to be Ooh. honest. I think that's something that I will be thinking about for a long time. Um, I'm not saying that I don't think people can't wear many hats and like use power in different ways, but I think it's a little bit more complicated. But I'm, I tend to kind of try to stay on the optimistic side of the equation, which is it's amazing what you can get when you ask for it. And also to be um, clear about power dynamics, lack of equity, um, systems that you know people have privilege to, and really keeping that in mind. It's a very uneven world. The art world, the system in general, I think is really problematic. Um, and especially now more than ever, I think people are focused on that. Um, and starting to rethink how we can organize. So I think I'm rethinking a lot of that right now, and I think a lot of people in the field are recognizing the problem of our field in general and how it really, you know, power and money and control um, can really create some issues. But I do think, um, you know, it's true what Edgar was saying. If you really believe in something, truly, and you're not scared to ask for help, it's really amazing what people will do to help you, and in exchange, what you can do to help them. Courtney, can I ask a question quick? You mentioned about like most of the organizations in, in, uh, in common practice aren't nonprofits. I'm curious what models they're pursuing or experimenting with. I would say they're not sure, or they're fiscally sponsored, meaning they have another nonprofit who receives funds for them so that they don't have to have the governance or board structures in place. Um, oftentimes, I'd say they're very loose. They don't, they're not meant to um, exist forever. They're not necessarily supposed to be sustainable. They're serving a specific pur purpose for a specific moment. They might like, burn bright and die out and not last, and I actually think that's okay. I think this idea of um, sustainability is really strange, and not everything is meant to last. And if you really look um, at the history of this work, some of the most important, impactful projects were like, they lasted for a year, and they left a huge mark. And um, I think that we need to let go of some of our preconceived notions about what that can look like, actually. Embracing all the forms. I mean, what, what's amazing to me is I travel around like Sharon and I go to all these cities and connect with groups and we have meetups and what people say to me is they say, I didn't realize I was part of a field. <laughs> I just thought I was doing this thing. Mm -hmm. And they're young sometimes and they just want to do something for their community and help other artists and I think 
that recognition that there's a larger sense of what they're doing and a larger movement. It's like, it's a movement, actually. Yeah. I really agree with that. So what I'm going to do is we're going to open up to audience and then if, after um, we have some questions, I'm going to have Tim and George read a little bit from their essays because I think what, well, what's happened on this tour, especially on that first tour, and now 25 stops into this, People usually go out to dinner after these things, or they hang out and they have alcohol and they talk further. And what I notice is a lot of artists talk about the nitty gritty, like how they uh, just keep going on. And these guys are gonna go into the nitty gritty to leave off all of us. But in the meantime, I'd love for people to ask these wonderful people some questions if you have them. So we'd like to enter it. Yes. Well, Anu. I'm not sure exactly what my question is. I think I have a lot of questions, uh, but I also have a lot of thoughts. Um, but I do need to speak up for the nonprofits a little bit. <laughs> um, not that they are the only model or the best model, because I don't think they necessarily are, but I do think that there is something to the fact that there are a lot of aspects of surviving as an artist that artists are neither temperamentally suited to, nor do they really have time for, and yet if nobody does it for them, they will die. And that's what nonprofits really exist to do. And not only that, but they have the potential to be one of the few collective or possibly anarchic spaces that we have sanctioned in this generally hierarchical, corporatized culture. So I think what we see that is problematic is the corporatization of nonprofits in the same way that we see the corporatization of the university. But I don't know that anybody in this room would say, well, we should just dispose of higher education because the university has become problematic for its corporatization. In the same way, I don't think we can really say we should dispose of the nonprofit just because we see so many nonprofits that are problematic in their corporatization. So I think that's really important to talk about, and I think that it's really important to think about how a lot of the nonprofits that we have in the LA landscape, like Lace or 18th Street, where I work, um, or Southern Exposure, where Courtney used to run in the, in the Bay Area, began as those small collectives of artists that were taking care of each other. And sometimes they were not sustainable and they didn't grow to be a different kind of institution. We pushed them into the next space. Sometimes then it took them a really long time to figure out what they were doing there. And I don't think necessarily that all spaces should survive just because they were open or even because they had a history. But I'm really interested in what nonprofits can actually do right now. Um, to speak to the NEA point, I think it's really important that the NEA give us money even if it's not enough money because just the symbolic value of the government does invest in the arts brings other people to invest in the arts because it reiterates the value of the arts. So even if that's not a huge contribution to your bottom line, um, as Edgar said, money follows money. So you get that NEA money, then you get the California Arts Council money, then you get the Irvine Foundation money, then you get the Community Foundation money, et cetera, et cetera. Then you get the donor money, and eventually you build something. But the whole point is that it shouldn't, as we said, be about the institution preserving itself as an institution. The institution is an arm of redistribution. And so it really depends on how you run it and who's in your nonprofit. That, I think, determines everything. But that's also true for galleries. It's true for individual artists. And the other point that I want I think that is the question is, can we talk a little bit about accountability? Because I think what I'm hearing in a lot of this is that there's very little accountability in the art world. And I think that's also true for artists who are playing this role as cultural producers in a social sense. So often, and I teach artists who are working this way too, people come in and they are motivated by a self-driven agenda. And that can be very motivating and very sustaining for an artist, but it doesn't necessarily guarantee any sort of connection or production of value for a community. Uh, and there isn't a lot of good mechanism existing to check in on that regularly and find out what's going on. A responsible community embedded nonprofit can be the check on that sort of so, honor. so I want to hear people talk Great. about their ideas. Right. Right. Can you start? Oh. I do have something very specific to say about that. Uh, Microphone. Yeah. Okay. I, I, it, it, let us recognize that we are inside of a long-standing nonprofit organization yes. that they were kind <laughs> enough to host us and to bring us all together. So yeah, so let's not poo-poo on nonprofits all entirely. <laughs> Accountability is important, and individual vision, particularly for arts nonprofits, is is an important gateway for. And for a project to get its footing, but again, I sort of, I sort of just to remove the individual intention for a second. I mean, 
the tendency of the, of the system does produce certain kinds of distortions that are difficult to reconcile. So this is this is a book, I forget who the author is, but it's called From Good to Great, and it was the, it was like tracking what 100 companies in America have thrived and become great and which ones are good. And the ones that the ones that were great are the ones that the that the leadership was able to successfully integrate its values and vision into the constituency of the organization or the company. So like Lee Iacocca at Ford, is he at Ford? Chrysler. Chrysler, Chrysler. thank you. That's why you do that. Um, uh, at Chrysler, um, was great when he was there, but when he left, you know, what happened to the company? What happened to Apple when Steve Jobs died prematurely? But in the arts, we value and support in great amounts the vision of the author and the individual. But most nonprofits really depend upon that diffused building of the team. So these two things oftentimes collide when you have the charismatic leader who's supposed to be the artist author, but then they're also supposed to be a leader who diffuses their power. Right? And these two things collide in a way in which most arts and nonprofits, at least that are run by artists, have never been able to fully reconcile. Courtney, you want to say something? Yeah, absolutely. Um, just to maybe build off of that a little bit, um, I'm I'm personally a huge fan of the nonprofit. Um, I, I'm a I'm a true believer in, in its form, and I actually, as problematic as the field is, and as much as people I think are moving away from it, I do think that right now is the most perfect moment to rethink how it can work differently and how it's time to reinvent, but still use its core value system. Um, I'm really interested in your question about um, accountability in particular, something that's really been on my mind. And I think the idea that this information is not being shared more publicly and more transparently, and what does it mean to run a nonprofit? How are decisions made? How are resources um, shared? How are financial um, choices made, who makes them, how does it work. I see there's a growing movement of smaller organizations out there, at least that I see through Common Field, that are really trying to make their value system very public and very um, and, and um, are, uh, share that. And also um, modeling what they're doing in a way that they can give it out to other people who can then use it themselves. And I'd say this sort of um, reversal of the power to kind of redistribute uh, openly share, it's almost like the open sourcing of the nonprofit. What would it mean if Lace documented how it did everything, published that, and gave it out to as many groups as possible, and then a million Laces opened all around the country? I'd say I see that happening more and more right now, and um, I think taking it back and reinventing it in a way that could be really fascinating. Um, so I do think that there's a lack of accountability, a lack of um, shared. Um, information. I think a lot of artists are really confused about how nonprofits work and why certain choices get made and how money is, you know, gained and what that really means. But but at its very core, I'm still I'm still a big fan actually, just personally. Um, I I think they addressed it much better than I'm going to. But I think one thing I did want to say is I think any governmental money comes with the ideology. And I think governments fund things that reinforce their ideology in different kinds of ways. And the reality is that the American government isn't, a, you know, the perfect thing. And some of us really disagree with the ideology that they fund. Do you know? And whether and that even trickles down to the nonprofits they fund, all these kind of arts funding. So I just want to make, I just want to point that out too. Like that's also the other part of the equation. And and I mean, sometimes we may agree with the ideology, but it's still an ideology that sort of gets propagated. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is, I think in terms of accountability, let me tell you, it is the hardest thing in the world, in, in the art world, to actually get people on record about. I mean, this world is so hard to do that. Like, people will not go on record, everyone has a fear, everyone thinks they're gonna be shunned, you know, or whatever, and I, you know, I haven't seen that happen a lot, to be quite honest, even people, but, the, but this, we, that's another perception that we perpetuate, right? Like, the idea that if you, like, call out your gallerist for not paying you the money they owe you, somehow no one's gonna work with you. Let me tell you how many times we get tips 
about like, oh, this person didn't pay me. I go, that's great, will you go on record? No. I was like, so what do you expect me to do? <laughs> do you know, I was like, what, I'm gonna write some gossip piece about like some gallery not paying? But do you know what I mean? So it's like, so where are we going to, where's that gonna start? Do you know? As where, the artist. The artist has to have the courage to do True, that. True, but I also think we put a lot of pressure on artists, too. Like, you know, it's like, why is it the, you know, I mean, now, of course, we're seeing collectors suing galleries, and, and we're, getting, we're finally getting, like, the opaqueness of sort of appearing as they appear in court documents, you know, and stuff like that. So that's kind of an interesting development in terms of accountability. Well, you know, you know how hard it is to fund, and, you know, we've even explored, how do we fund that? Do you know? And, and you know what, I'll tell you, foundations don't want to fund that either. That's actually a reality. Mm -hmm. Do you know, they don't want to fund that because that's not as sexy as you think, you know what I mean? And, and the reality is the networks of funding, you know, they're all connected, you know? So it's like, oh, you're calling at this person, but you know, we gave them money or whatever. Like, you don't know, like, I'm not gonna sit there and research everybody I write and say, who's funding them? Oh, wait, what? Uh, but how is this connected to this person that gives us money or whatever? You know, so that is a problem. Yeah. And we haven't figured out how to solve that problem at all. And I think even like anonymous, like I, I don't believe in the sort of anonymous calling out because I, at the end of the day, I think if you're going to call someone out like that, you need to like sort of, you have to be accountable. You have to be accountable. Exactly. Wait, don't you think that artists can have the courage to, I know, yeah, absolutely. Have, but I think artists should have the courage to do it. I think that's where it's going to change. And then artists have to stop uh, also uh, not taking gigs for free. So we have, oh, I loved hearing that. That was good. To demand that we have to be paid or don't do it. So we, we also have to police ourselves and we have to do things ourselves to change our culture. And I'm calling on my fellow artists to do that. So that's the way things are gonna change in trolling and not be afraid. So I've, I've sued people publicly before, and uh, I sued a corporation for my work, and I remember people telling me, you're going to lose this, you're going to lose that, and I was like, fuck that, I'm not going to lose it, and I didn't. So I think that if you, once you do it, you can do it over and over and over again. <laughs> Hopefully you don't have to do it over and over again. <laughs> but the point is, is that, that I don't think we need to have that fear within us. I think we have a lot more power than we think. Other questions? Yes, all the way in the back. Can you stand up so we can hear you? Yeah, I was going to say, it's not so much, well, it's a complicated question, but there's a lot of grievances that I know, and I sort of see it as, uh, like, all relationships. Nothing's perfect, so when we have these relationships with governments that give us money and corporations that give us money, inevitably they have the money because when you look at sort of financial structures, it's grouped within a few institutions. When we have to ask for money from different places, they have their agendas and we have our agendas and they may not always coincide, but like all relationships, you have to find that happy medium and you can't just let them run over and get what they want and the same thing you have to stand up for yourself and ask for what you need as well. But when I look at other places in the world and I you know, I've kind of been to some other places, even though I was really, really, really unhappy about being in LA for a long time. Once you go to other places and you see the, the dynamic in other parts of the world, and you're like, oh, thank goodness, we have some things in place. They're completely imperfect, but there are people that care about the environment. There are people that care about arts and culture. There are little pieces in place. And so I hate to see everybody just kind of scrap the NEA and scrap nonprofits and scrap all the things because at the end of the day I actually think that the combination of all these things and people pushing back to find that balance is a good thing so not giving up but kind of pushing forward because it's it's kind of like our healthcare system boy is it imperfect but if we get rid of it entirely and we start at ground zero and not have anything at all we're in a world of hurt again so I think it's a better thing to try and push to try and get more and get more of the things that we need do you want to ask a question Huh? Oh, yeah, I know. I mean, it's like... <laughs> you want other questions or comments? Yeah. Paul. Um, oh. I have a comment and a question. I just want to comment that there are not for profits come in different sizes and shapes. So, Lace is a not for profit. White people is where I worked at had three staff members. It's a not for profit. Yeah. And uh, Yale, when I worked there, had 200 staff members. And the Catholic Church is not for profit. So they all yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But my question, since we're in Hollywood, what is this? Um, I think the art industry and the uh, 
our field is, uh, is very much broken. We don't take care of each other. We are at, at a, uh, in a pro bono community where you, you know, can you write for free, can you lecture for free, can you teach for free, uh, can you show at our institution for free. Um, in Hollywood, somehow they figured out that if you work in the field, if you do one job, you have health insurance for that whole year, right? Um, in a field where their catering budget, if it's a large movie, is larger than some of the mid-sized visual, visual arts not-for-profits, right? So who can be our mentors from the movie industry to talk to the visual arts industry so we can go start inching towards that industry? I, I think we're only starting to approach the scale in the art community where we can start talking about that seriously. Right. I think that's an issue. You know, like, I think we're, we have to remember, I mean, I think we have, we often feel like the art world is much bigger than it is. It's actually not that big, do you know? And it's like, and I think we're only getting to a scale where that makes sense. Like, the other thing is, like, auctions. Like, I would like to fight for the fact that, like, they should be a little more transparent. We should know who buys and sells. Do you know, like just like you do a building, you know, like property or something. But it's eventually, I feel like we're gonna get there as the numbers get bigger and as the industry gets bigger and there are more of us, do you know? And I think like, I mean, I'm sure a lot of us remember, but the art world was much smaller, do you know, 20 years ago. I mean, much smaller, do you know? And it's like, and I don't think we're, like we're just seeing the, the actual numbers to make that make sense, do you know? And I think that's, that's one of the things that's changed. We're too small. We're, we're getting bigger, but we are. We're still much smaller than the movie industry, music industry, whatever you want to say. We're like, we're that big compared to that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but I think it's also about demand and value. There's demand and value in the movie business. There isn't in the visual arts business. So I think we have to up our game to increase that value. And we also have to get, you probably agree with this, museums to be more open and reach out to those communities so that there is more integration and that it, I don't know how you're going to do that or how you're doing that at MIT. I know you're working on that, but I think that, that there are some museums that are closed off and they don't, they're not sanctuary museums and they're not uh, opening their doors as wide as they should. We're not as public as we should be, whereas the movie industry is very much for the public and that's the difference. So I think that we have to be much more integrated. The movie industry is not that stable either and it also right. has a very stretched middle class. And in the, you know what, in the art industry, if you want to build walls for exhibitions for a living, you can also get a day job and get health insurance at least some of the time. Right, but I don't think there's anything such thing as a day job, by the way. I hate that, by the way. I have to correct you on that. Because we're still artists no matter what kind of job we take, so it's not, we're not part-time. But I just want to correct that. I'm just saying that in terms of, in terms of what kind of opportunities are supported in the film world, there are also the opportunities to be a piece of some other anointed person's vision, most of the time, with a very, very, very narrow pipeline to who gets to actually set the vision. One of the beautiful things about the visual art world is actually that it's much more democratic who gets to have their vision realized, and part of that's because we work with smaller budgets. I just don't think we should romanticize Hollywood in terms of being some kind of haven for creators. Yeah, but I think it's Paul has really quite, it's, it's, yeah, it's quite a complicated thing. Yeah. yeah, but we're talking about the art industry where like, security guards are not full-time anymore. Do you know what I mean? They're not realizing their vision. You know what I mean? Like, like how many security guards are full-time with benefits? I mean, when I covered a protest at the Guggenheim, somebody was like, you know, these people are only paying $10 an hour. Why are you doing this? And I'm like, what? The Guggenheim guard is paying $10 an hour? And I asked the Guggenheim, they're like, well, we pay our contractors $24. What they pay for to the security guard is we don't know. And I'm like, I was like, why are your security guards not full-time? Do you know, like this is, so we're not even talking about the artist, we're talking about like the security guard doesn't, can't even like make a living wage. Okay. Mm. I, can I say one more thing about yeah. this um, really quickly, which is, I think that we're forgetting maybe that a lot of the artists who wrote for this book are engaging in alternate um, economies. Alternate Absolutely. Models. Absolutely. They're not dealing with uh, money. They're actually trying to be change makers, yeah. working in communities, uh, using alternate models. And so I think there's not a financial, there's not a price tag sometimes on these things. Um, and as a result, there isn't money for those things. So I think there's a really different value system at play. And that's part of the reason why I think that world doesn't translate very well. Mm -hmm.
And I do agree, it would be nice if we all got health insurance and had a union. And I think Paul brings up a good point. Carolyn. Yeah, um, I'm go ahead. I'm pretty glad. Um, I just want to take issue with the lack of power for the artist. Yeah. Um, statistically, I hear it all the time, there's a lobbying group in Washington, D.C. called the Business Community for the Arts, which downloads a lot of data to the Otis um, report that comes out in annually about the power and the value of the arts. And it is statistically proven that, in, particularly in Southern California, that the driver for the economy is not the sports, it is museums, and it is concert halls. And like, I'm not talking about, you know, necessarily the big, you know, ones downtown. Theater groups, um, museums, galleries, those are the economic drivers in Southern California. And so I think that we maybe underplay our power. What we don't do is leverage it. Mm -hmm. And if people, I mean, that Otis report that is funded comes out with some amazing data. But I don't think it kind of gets out to the regular people, or we don't really kind of uh, bandy it as loudly as we should, that there's a real power base in the creative community that we don't really embrace and stand up for. Um, I think people underestimate that there's a lot of people, I mean, particularly in Southern California. Um, if, I mean, me in particular at the Women's March, everybody I saw was an artist <laughs> in that, you know, coming downtown. It's three quarters of a million people, I would say, people that were there. Half of the people were in the creative industry, easily, or married to, or parents of. So I think we underestimate the numbers that are there and the power base that we have. I think we have a, we definitely have a power base. But we, you're correct that we don't leverage it. So I would, these books wouldn't be going off the shelves if artists were doing that. I have to say. So, and every time I go to a venue and talk to an artist, and I'm waiting for it after we conclude today, that you know people want artists seek permission all the time. They seek validation. That's not a position of power. So whatever I understand that report, Minnesota is amazing too. But I'll tell you, in Minnesota, the number one funder in the country for the arts, those artists, a lot of them complain that they don't have opportunities because they don't make them themselves. It's a grant culture. So I, I just, I'm, I'm lathering right now. Like I can feel myself, um, my teeth hurt when you're saying this. Because it's great that you say that, but the reality of the situation is not, to be honest. How many artists do you ever talk to that say, the first thing that they say is, I want to leave school, I want to get a gallery, as the source of dependence. And we even step outside of that to think there's other things. So we have a long way to go to change that. So those numbers that you're talking about, great, fantastic. They need to be proven and there needs to be action so that there's the power is actually shifted. I don't, I, I think that the report is great. I don't believe the nitty gritty, the day to day, actually. I don't believe that from artists that actually they're using their power fully. No, I, I agree, and that's why, you know, we're talking about many times I've worked at UCLA for 14 years, not once was there any kind of a business course. Yeah, but it's not. Any, I mean, how do you I have even to. approach a gallery? Right, right. The fundamentals about Correct. It, you know. Right, well, there's no one way to be an artist either, right? There's no one way to conduct themselves, there's many ways. So I want to conclude this, because we have to conclude soon. I want, thank you. I want to conclude by just getting to that, because I think that the core is back to the individual. We're all individuals, and that's where it counts the most. So I just want to conclude with these two essays, just these two paragraphs. So Tim, I want you to start, and then George will conclude just a few paragraphs, and then we'll have a reception and book signing, and we can talk further, and you can ask, um, uh, you can ask Harag, Courtney, and Edgar more questions. Is that okay with all of you? Great, go for it. You know where, where to go, right? And speak loudly. Yeah, I think you need the mic. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and I don't know if you, if anyone doesn't know about the first book, but that it was basically, I mean, it was um, living and staying creative life and that the, um, assignment that we got from Sharon was basically uh, not that it was an advice book and that it was basically just to talk about how we sustain and sustain ourselves not just artistically but just how we basically live our lives and keep going. So um, 
with that. That's my essay. For me, sustaining a creative, creative life would not be possible, or at least not very interesting, without the support of my partner of over 20 years, now 28. Um, muse, critic, editor, sounding board, and one-man support system. He always encourages me to soldier on. Even when I take off for a month or two to recharge at an artist residency program in some remote part of the world. Then of course, there's the extended network of family and friends who support what I'm doing, whether or not they understand it or not. We spend time together hanging out, preparing meals, hiking in local mountains, taking in a movie, or an occasional concert or performance. Also, we, a weekly routine of yoga and spinning classes help me keep sane. <laughs> that no longer is. <laughs> I now have a dog. I now have all exercises with the dog. This was written a long time ago. It's <laughs> five years old. Um, all these activities, taken as a whole, keep me going and fortify my art practice in subtle but substantial ways. Exploring things like that exploring things that interest me, like natural phenomena, science, music, dance, or traveling to new places near and far, all inspire, inspire me and feed my creativity. I'm usually not even conscious of the influence such things have on my work or, my pro or on my process until after I finish the body of work. It may not be that obvious to viewers, but I see the influences of these interests interest in the work and consider my pursuit of them a vital part of my creative life. Yeah, I think that's really centered and grounded. Thank you. George. George, George the cover, cover boy. <laughs> boy. Yes, sorry. Uh, cover man. Uh, the interrelationships between artists, dealers, collectors, curators, historians, etc. are symbiotic. We're all in it together. Uh -huh. Yes. Mm -hmm. at, uh, at one of my first studio visits, I was given some value, valuable advice. The dealer suggested that I show my work to other artists. This has proven to be solid. Other artists introduced me to my first dealers and also curated my work in the first group shows I was part of in New York and Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I've also had the pleasure of introducing other artists I admire to dealers and collectors. I like the challenge of making art. My primary motivation is curiosity. I really do want to know what something will be like if I make it. The most satisfying aspect of being an artist for me is to spend most of my time working out ideas. From the beginning of mankind, some of us have been artists. And my intention is to contribute to this ongoing ancient conversation. I love that. That is a perfect ending to this. So thank you everybody.